But if you'll turn with me to Romans, the 12th chapter, I've been looking forward to this for a while. Because up to now, Paul has been making theological arguments uh, against the Romans, and I mean against the, Greek, the uh, Hebrews, the Jews, and their way of looking at uh, God and, and uh, their way of worship. And, and honestly, it was mostly about their way of salvation. In the first 12 chapters, Paul talks about the, the desperate need of the world to get right with God. And you have Romans, first three chapters in Romans. And then he starts talking about some of the, 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 the way to get right with God is justification. To be justified. To believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and having God count one's faith as righteousness. That was Romans 3, verse, uh, 3 and uh, chapters 5, verses, uh, chapter 5 to uh, chapter 3 to chapter 5. I'll get it right. And then in, in chapter 6, he begins talking about how a believer can become sanctified, which is really that is set apart to God <clears throat> to be free from sin to life eternal. And that goes all the way to the ninth chapter. And then in the ninth chapter through the eleventh chapter, he talks about the believer or the church and how it's not Israel no more that is God's choice to carry this gospel to the whole world. And then we get to the twelfth chapter. I want you to understand something. He's talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's not trying to get people saved. He's trying to help them understand how they were saved. So this is the glorious message. Can we turn this down just a little bit? Thank you. This is the glorious message of how much God loves us and how much God has done for us the first 11 chapters. Uh, this is what's meant when we hear about the tender mercies, the, the mercies of God. And the mercies of God are overflowing. You know, they're beyond what any person could desire. Just think about what God has done for us. God has met our desperate need to get right with Him. I hope that He's done that. And I hope that you are right with Him. He provided the power to be set free from the terrible bondage of this life and to live eternally. I can't think of anything more binding or captive to keep a person captive than not knowing what happens to you after you die. I mean, it's got to terrify folks. I don't like it, but I'm not terrified by it. But He's provided an answer for that. He's given the most glorious purpose in life. He's given me a reason to live. And that is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't have to guess why I'm here. And there are a lot of folks today wondering, why am I here? I've got a purpose. It's a divine purpose. It's not one that I've made up. Of how to be free from sin and death and to live eternally. So that brings us to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And let's read what this says. Now I've got to tell you something. This is my translation. And in doing so, I've studied it. I've looked at it about a hundred times inside and out. And it's not that much different than what you'll see in your King James. But I'll tell you something. When we get to it, you're going to see a, 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 you know, a difference between some of the translations in a particular word here. Therefore. Alright. The word therefore. Because of all this. He take, he's saying because of the previous 12 chapters. Okay. Of everything that he's written so far, this is his summation. Therefore. 
I am urging you all, brothers, through the mercies of God, to present your living bodies a sacrifice while living set apart, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual divine worship. Because of everything he's talked about, which includes the Romans' road, by the way, if you don't know. <laughs> Every bit of the Romans' road we've already covered in the first 11 chapters. The first thing we see here is the mercies of God. I want you to think about all the mercies of God that Paul has explained to us so far. Justification from the guilt and penalty of sin adoption in Jesus and an identification being identified with Christ that were placed under grace not law he's given us the Holy Spirit to live within us there's promise of help in all of our afflictions assurance of a standing in God's choice Confidence of a, His coming glory. Confidence of no separation from the love of God. Romans 8. He's never going to stop loving us and there's nothing we can do about it. Confidence in God's continued faithfulness. So, if you want to say, if you want to say that this is His mercies, I go with it. This is His mercies. Because we don't deserve any of it. And so through his ten the mercies of God, he's brothers. Notice he says brothers. He's not talking to anyone else but saved believers. So he's not trying to get them saved. And so what is he telling these folks? Since we know all of this, and I'm hoping that we can all say the same thing, and that Paul's talking to us as brothers and sisters in Christ. So what is he saying? For us to do. Since we know all of this stuff that he, Paul has just talked about, what does he want us to do? Present your living bodies a sacrifice. Now, I want you to understand something. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices when they put on the altar were already dead. <laughs> they were already dead. So, and you know what the problem with living sacrifices is? They keep wanting to get off the altar. <laughs> they, well, and think about it. I, Lord, I present myself a living sacrifice. We put ourselves in the altar and we see that dagger and we go, oh, no, 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 I think I'll go. I, I, I'll do this some other time. And that's what happens with living sacrifices. But it's best to see the idea of the body here referring to our entire being and not just this body. I know some commentators who who think it's talking about this body, this physical flesh. He's talking much more than just this physical flesh. Right. Whatever we say about our spirit, soul, flesh, and mind, we know that they live, each of them lives in our bodies. So when we give our bodies to God, the soul and spirit go with it. So presenting your bodies means that God wants you, not just your work, Guess that? He wants you. He wants you to sacrifice yourself and not just your time, not just your money, not just other things or the work that you do. He wants you to sacrifice you. Put your all on the altar. Not just what, not just what Abel, uh, Cain did. Remember what Cain did? He gave his works. Present your all. <clears throat> you may do all kinds of work for God, but you can and never give Him yourself. I have a feeling that we have a lot of Christian folks today who have given their works 
It never gave them their all. In the first century, the first century people, both the Jews and the pagans, knew firsthand what sacrifice was all about. Said that urge, I urge, I am urging you all. So the so the beg <clears throat> means that the will is to be the master of the body. Not the body to be the master of the will. I just couldn't help myself. You ever heard that? I just couldn't help myself. I just had these feelings and this this feeling, and I just couldn't resist. <clears throat> well, the thinking of our age says that our body must tell the will to do what to do. But it says, but the Bible tells us that it is our will that must bring our body into a, as a living sacrifice to God. In other words, we can actually be in control and we can actually say, body, I don't care what you want, we're giving ourselves up to God. <clears throat> there are way too many folks today who won't do that. Who's never done that. Or if they've done it once, they crawl off the altar. <laughs> because you see, a sacrifice, or a living sacrifice, is not just a sacrifice of one time of then. It's not like salvation. A living sacrifice means you stay, you get on the altar, and you stay on the altar. For the rest of your life. You're, you're basically, and when you decide, and there are times in life, and maybe you've been there, maybe you haven't, but you decided that you were going to get off the altar for a while. You've taken yourself off the altar. You know, the body is a wonderful servant, but it's a terrible master. Keeping it at God's altar as a living sacrifice keeps the body where it should be. He also says here, while living set apart, acceptable to God. In the Old Testament, Every sacrifice had to be holy and acceptable to God. In Leviticus, he shall bring a male without blemish. And in Deuteronomy 15, but if there is a defect in it, if it is lame or blind or has any serious defect, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. And then, remember, the idea of a sweet aroma to the Lord is almost always linked to the burnt offerings that 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 smell. Uh, there's a, a burning in this matter of a living sacrifice. It shows that Paul has in mind the burnt offering in which the entire sacrifice was given to the Lord. And in some sacrifices, the one offering the sacrifice and the priest shared in some of the meal, but never in the burnt offering. Now, the holiness we bring to the altar is a decision for holiness and yielding to the work of the holiness in our life. You know why we need to be on the altar? Well, as we present our bodies a living sacrifice, God makes our life holy by burning away the impurities. That's the reason we offer ourselves up to Him in our lives. And he burns, begins to burn away the unholiness. Which is your spiritual divine worship. Some of you, probably most of you, have got a King James or another version that says reasonable service. That's what I grew up. And it's, and it's a legitimate translation. I'm not saying that it should be this or that. I kind of am because I put it <laughs> but and I always grew up thinking this is your reasonable service and I said well I hate to see the unreasonable service <laughs> I, I mean I, I thought I don't understand and then I did the word study the word search and, and understand and then I saw some other translation and they, they said it was divine worship I'm going what how can you how can it be one translation say worship and, and trust me they're all split Half of them thinks it's that, the other half thinks it's this. 
So how can it be divine worship and be reasonable service? How, how do you get that? Well, in context, the verse talks about is dealing with, we've talked about sacrifice. It's not a uh, so it stands to read in the Old Testament, guess what sacrifice was? It was their worship. And so it stands to reason that the analogy here would continue. And he's actually referred to, and I think he means to talk about divine worship. You see, what this indicates is it's not the sacrificing of animals that's worship. And worship isn't showing up to church. Worship isn't singing hymns. But worship, in effect, would be presenting yourselves as a living sacrifice with a life that is set apart and acceptable to God. That would be real worship. Therefore, I am urging you all, brothers, through the tender mercy, through the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living, your living bodies, a sacrifice while living set apart, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual divine worship. I think we've got, irregardless of this, of this verse and this and, and the translation of these words, I think we got worship all wrong about what God finds acceptable. We worry on whether or not it's an old hymn or whether it is acceptable or a contemporary song is acceptable to God. We worry about all kinds of different things about worship and wonder if that's acceptable to God when in fact it's not up to... <clears throat> worship is not really and truly about us gathering together and singing songs. It's not truly about hearing a message, but it's truly about whether or not you place yourself on the altar of God and give and make yourself a living sacrifice. That is what God accepts as worship. Amen. Not a whole lot of folks are going to agree with me on that. Because it destroys all their arguments about what they think worship is. And about your doing it wrong. True worship is giving them yourself. When you've got a group of people that lay themselves on the altar and they come together, then we really have worship together. I can't make you worship. I can't make anybody worship. The only thing that I can do is put myself on, my, on the altar as a living sacrifice. That's worship. In verse 2, not only, so what do we do? Well, we really need to worship. <laughs> but in verse 2, we really need to change. Do you not agree with that? We really need to change. And, and here we are, the first Sunday of 2022, and it's going to be a great year, right? Well, this past two years, we'll just forget about it, and everything's going to change. We're going to go on that diet. We're going to, we're going to do all the things that we haven't been able to do in the last two years. We're, we're all, we got that honeydew list that we're going to get it all done and we're going to, you know, whatever goals that you have for this year, we know it's going to happen this year, right? We say this every year, don't we? But we really do need to change. We really do. And you all be not conformed by this world. But you all be transformed by the renewal of the mind so that you all may prove what is the will of God. Good, acceptable, <coughs> and complete. Conform. The word conform comes from the root word schema. And you know what that means? It means fashion. The outward form. The appearance of a man. 
It's the, it's the appearance of a man that changes from day to day and from year to year. Except for a few of us, we've not changed, right, man? We, we, stay, we stay the same, right? Man, when I mean, you look at old pictures, <laughs> you realize how much we've changed. Especially some of these kids here. Right? We've got some pictures, and that wasn't that long ago, and they were little babies, and we're going, what happened? You know? Don't you really, a man dresses differently for work than he does when he gets home and gets relaxed. The appearance is different because of the, because of the, a man looks different as a young man than he does as an older man. So his schema or his fashion, his outward appearance differs. change because of who we are around. Do you know people that they begin to act like who they're hanging out with? It happens a lot with, with teenagers especially. They start acting the way that the who they're around. Well this warns us that the world system, the culture, the popular culture and the manner of thinking, and remember this, this culture is against God rebellion against God, it will try to conform us to its ungodly pattern. Don't try to deny it, it's happening. And it's happened to us. Things that were found that were, that were unacceptable to God, Christians are finding acceptable today because the world has pressured us. Made us conform to the world and its thinking. You see, the world, the very fashion, the, the very fashion and appearance of the world, it seems to be lasting, permanent, and unending. We think that if something is true today in this world, then it's true forever. That's not true. The things that the world wants you to believe today are going to say it is absolutely true that you must you must think this way ten years from now. No, not even ten years from now, a year from now, six months from now. We'll tell you something totally different and it changes. You see, the world offers something they say is permanent. And it offers the very best of everything. It offers pleasure, enjoyment, happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, completeness. But let me tell you something, that is a lie. It is an illusion. This world can offer you nothing but pain and misery because it is a world of rebellion against sin and it wants you as a Christian believer to fall right into their world. To believe what they believe. This world will pass away, but the Word of God does what? Stand forever. Then it tells us to do not be conformed, but to be transformed. And the ancient Greek word is a metamorpho. Is the Greek is the Greek word metamorph? And you know what word that means? You know we remember from science metamorphosis. That caterpillar magically turning into a butterfly. Nothing magic about it. It was a change ordained by God to change on the outside. He was always that on the inside. It was just the outside that changed. Now I've gotten a little older, but I don't think I've changed that much on the inside. I was all I've always been Randy. I've not always been that old man. Sometimes we forget that, don't we? It's just I've blossomed into a beautiful blood of butterflies I've got. It's the same word, metamorpho, metamorpho, the same word that he uses in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, at his transfiguration. That's the same word. He transfigured. He changed. 
And we're to do this by the this glorious transformation by the renewal of the mind. Now this is the opposite of being conformed to the world. You see, the battleground between conforming to the world and being transformed is within the mind of the believer. That's the battleground. The world does not make you believe anything. God does not make you believe anything. It's the battle what you believe in your mind. Christians, and so Christians must think differently than the world. You've got to think, I don't want to be conformed to this world. I want to be transformed. So how do I do it? By the renewing of your mind. The problem with many Christians is they live their lives based on feelings and not actually thinking. Now, the life based on feelings says, well, how do I feel today? How, how do I feel about my job? How, how do I feel about my wife? And how do I feel about worship? And how do I feel about my preacher? Well, the life by feeling will never know the transforming power of God because it, renew, because it ignores the renewing of the mind. You can't think like that no more. You see, the life based on doing, on feeling, says, how do I feel today? The life based on doing says, don't give me your theology. Just tell me what to do. Give me a list of things to do to make it right with God, and I'll do it. Just four points and seven keys for that, uh, for that, and I'll be fine. So the life of doing will never know the transforming power of God because it re ignores the renewing of the mind. Now, God is never against the principles of feeling and doing. He is a God of powerful and passionate feeling, and He commands us to be doers. But feelings and doing things are completely insufficient foundations for the Christian life. I am sure that my wife at times does not like me. So when she wakes up and says, uh, how do I feel about my husband today? I don't like him at all. We all have those days. It's a rare day, I'm sure, but I'm sure we all have those days. You can't base things on feelings. There are days that I literally wake up and I don't feel saved at all, do you? There are other, other days that you wake up and you feel like that God is far away and you don't feel saved one bit. But intellectually, this is the battle where your mind has to say, no, God made a promise. I'm saved, child of God. And in Philippians, where he tells us to think on these things, and we begin to think on that, that is the renewing of our minds. And the more that we place ourselves on the altar of God, <clears throat> the better our mind, the, the clearer our minds will be about who we are and in our worship to Him. So the first question cannot be, how do I feel? Or what do I do? Where rather they should be, what is true here? What is true? What is real? Have you ever had feelings, intense feelings about something that was, that was just not true? It was based on a lie? You know? They just weren't true. And somebody tried to tell you, no, 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 but that's how I feel. And the better part. That's my truth. <laughs> oh, I hate that more than anything. Well, you gotta get, you gotta have this. That, that's your truth. No, there's only truth and there's lies, and there's nothing in between. There's no such thing as your truth. What is true, and what does God's word say? What does God's word say? 
how we can renew our mind. Is we get in God's Word and say, when Satan tells us you're a terrible, horrible person because you did this, and you read God's Word, you find out that God's grace is sufficient. He tells you the truth. The world says, okay, it's all right to be doing these things. Everybody's doing it. You're going to miss out a lot of fun. You go to God's Word and it says, thou shalt not do this. He tells you the truth. The world doesn't. That's how we renew our minds. We place ourselves in the altar of God and get into His Word and believe the truth that's in it. And why? So that we can prove what is the will of God. So as we are transformed on the inside, the proof is evident on the outside. Alright? That, cat that caterpillar was truly a butterfly all along on the inside, but you didn't know it until what? He showed it on the outside. He was transformed into it. It should be evident about who we are on the inside from the way we look on the outside. So that others can see the good and acceptable and perfect will of God through our life. Paul here explains how to live out the will of God. You've got to keep in mind the, the rich mercy of God to you, past, present, and in the future. We've got to understand by the act of intelligent spiritual worship that we yield our entire self to Him, we present our, our bodies a living sacrifice. That we resist conformity to the thoughts and actions of this world. Do not be conformed by focus on God's Word and fellowship with Him, we can be renewed, be transformed by the renewal of our minds. Guys, the battle truly is in here for each one of us. We need to change. I, you know, I don't know what change needs to be made in our lives, but I know there's change that needs to be made. And that's really between you and God. You see, then your life, by if you renew your mind and, and, and you actually place yourself in, in a position of worship every day, that will, your life will be in the will of God. Your life will prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, you may not know what the good, and perfect, acceptable will of God is. You may not be able to, well, I know what that is. I can tell you what it is. But you can't prove it in your life apart from transform, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. You see, we need to change. And the only way we're going to do that is not by willpower. It's by fighting that battle in your mind about knowing the truth about what's going on in this world and what the Bible says. That's true. And that's the battle that we've got to fight. <clears throat> but you see, Paul never excludes those who are not believers. He always provides a way for them to understand the great mercy of God. Because he is talking about believers. You want to fight that battle? Well, you've got to be on the right team. You, you got to, right now, you're fighting for the other team. <laughs> There's no battle going on because you don't know Him as Savior. You're not, one, you're not a brother or sister of Christ. Paul spent 11 chapters talking about how a person can be right with God. You've got to recognize that you're a lost and dying sinner. It doesn't matter if you're a good person or not. It doesn't matter if you've sinned once without Christ you're a sinner. He also, Paul also told us that the price for that sin is death. The wages of sin is death. He also told us that God provided a way through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
that whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He sent His Son to come and die in our place to pay that price for your sin. That's the message that we're to get out. And that's the message a person needs to hear in order for there to be any hope of a transformation, a renewal of the mind. Any way or hope that a person can come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. To come to know the hope of, of living with Him in glory forever and ever after we pass from this life. You need to come to know Jesus Christ, to call upon His name, to ask Him into your heart and your life. And if He's calling you today, you can ask Him. He'll save you. You'll be His forever. And you'll be called brother and sister. And then we'll be talking to you about the renewal of the mind and about how to live. But until then, that's the important message. That's what you need to know. As we stand and prepare for an invitation, I don't know your heart, I don't know your, your mind, I just know what God has laid on my heart to deliver to you this morning. And I know what it means to me. That I need to spend more time on the altar. And I need to give my heart my life more to Him. And I need to quit crawling off of it when I get on when time get tough. <laughs> so this morning, as the Lord is dealing with your heart and your mind, about your salvation, about your need to present yourself a living sacrifice to God, if that's the case, then you respond to him this morning as we sing. Number 516. 516.